In real life, though, I, uh, I'm a zookeeper. Uh, do you all know my background at all? Or I work at, at the Auburn Nation School and I'm the president and CEO. Uh, I showed up when I was 23 years old and I've been there 40 years. I've never had a real job. Um, um, they knew how much I love my job. They wouldn't pay me as much as they paid me, they made me pay them. Because um, it's a wonderful, passionate job. You get to work with wildlife, saving species for the next generation, you get to work with families, kids, um, education, conservation research. Our kids in New Orleans can't fly to the San Diego Zoo. They can't go to the Monterey Aquarium. They have to learn nature in New Orleans. So we take that job very, very seriously in what we do for the kids in New Orleans. Um, and I hope everybody in this room has a love on a pretty day like today. You might see the birds migrating, you might see some flowers blooming. Uh, the moon at nighttime is a full moon right now. Nature's beautiful. Nature's wonderful. Nature's powerful. More powerful than anything in the world. And with that, um, we grew up loving life because we love nature. A lot of our kids grew up in a concrete jungle. They're not out in the country anymore. They're in the city. Um, and they're terrified of animals. They're terrified of dogs and cats. So we try to take them when they're little, hold their hand, take them in. <coughs> By the time we're finished with them, they're hugging an animal, they're something that sparks in their mind. Because life would not be as rich without having that love of animals. And, um, hello there. So uh, that's what I do. Um, I guess kind of an interesting story while we're, while we're tap dancing Lady Bourbon is that um, I was in graduate school at Tulane, and my dad came up to me, and you might have had the same experience, and my dad said, Son, it's time to get a job. And I said, real job? He said, yeah. I was in graduate school at Tulane. He said, it's time to get a real job. He said, I've been paying tuition a long time, and um, it's time for you to go make some money on your own. Um, so I said, no problem. I'm a smart kid. You know, in graduate school, I sent my resume out, and nobody responded. Now, now you go back to your parents and say, thank you for the tuition, but I can't get a job. <laughs> um, but finally, I got a response back from the um, Ottoman Zoo. I was in an MBA program, so the zoo is not, you know, that's not the direction I was thinking of. I have an interesting story there, too, that I don't know if you all know what you're going to do yet, but you probably don't. You're probably going to doing something completely different than you think you can do right now. Life experiences, you graduate and you move on, and you look for opportunities, and you go in all different kind of directions. That's what happened to me. So I, I went and applied for the job at the Oregon Zoo, and he said, like, we're a really bad zoo. It was called an Animal Ghetto by the New York Times. It was a prison for animals. It was a bad place in the 70s. Uh, and he said, what we need to do, the director said, what we need to do to bring more people into the zoo, they want to see certain animals. If you show them the animals, they'll come. And the one animal they want to see more than anything else that we can't get because it's such a bad zoo is a, is a gorilla. So he said, um, look, I'm going to show you a film. He showed me a film of a gorilla, he showed me the behavior of a gorilla. He said, we want you, the bright shooter for Tulane, just for the short term, be the gorilla. Put a gorilla costume on, get in the exhibit with the animals, be the gorilla. When attendance goes up, we start making money because people came to see the gorilla. Uh, then we'll promote you to a different job. What do you say? The joint job over right now. So, I'm in. You know, give me the gorilla costume. Um, and sure enough, put the costume on, get out there, and people really like me. I was really good at it. You know, I still feel really good about myself. Like, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty special. I'm a good gorilla. Um, I don't know what's going to take me, but I'm a good gorilla. So I'm in the costume, swinging around, beating my chest. Um, it was a busy Sunday. And the busy Sunday, um, there was a big crowd coming to visit me because they love me so much. In the old zoo, there was a rope. And you could swing on the rope. And if you would swing on the rope, you could swing over the tiger exhibit. And if you tease the tigers, they get really mad. They'll smile at you, they'll growl. And the public loves that. Gorilla swinging over, tiger, back and forth, back and forth. Crowds loving it. Well, busy Sunday, I'm swinging on my rope. And I got to the furthest part of the rope, and the rope started to break. And I see the tiger below, I see the crowd below me. And I'm not real proud of this, but I start screaming, probably with a high pitched voice. <laughs> someone, someone help me. I'm not really a gorilla. I'm a student from Tulane. Someone help me. Someone get me out of here. So I'm falling in the exhibit. The tiger's mouth got about this big. And I looked down, and the tiger said, shut up, you fool. You're going to ruin it for the rest of us. <laughs> Not true, but, but, um, but that's the kind of stuff we do. We, we deal, we, we bring animals in, we bring exhibits in, we turn the zoo around from what's called the worst zoo at Animal Ghetto to um, 
top five zoos in the country. San Diego would probably be number one. St. Louis, I don't know where y'all are from, but St. Louis has a great zoo. Um, um, we were in the top five, did great with that. Um, with that, we um, decided in the um, 80s, that was in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, the economy in New Orleans was crashing. Oil and gas was leaving Louisiana and moving to Texas. Bad move. We really did not handle that well in the 80s. But with the loss of the oil and gas industry, they said we had to diversify our economy. We had to bring more jobs to our community. And the easiest picking fruit for jobs was tourism. The more tourists you bring in, that means more hotels. It's like a manufacturer plant with some hotels. You put people in the rooms, go shop in the restaurants, they will shop in, in the department stores, they'll go to Urban Mayfield's Jazz Club, they'll go to the Ottoman, they'll spend money. So with that in mind, we said, let's go to the aquarium. Um, and the aquarium um, was modeled after the Monterey Aquarium in California, the National Aquarium in Baltimore. We said, let's build, let's build a um, world-class aquarium. Um, and we had to go to the voters in New Orleans to get a tax millage pass to say, here's part of the money, and you have to match with private money, to go build the premier aquarium in the country, if not the world in the riverfront of New Orleans. As we were going to the voters, there was a tax millage for public education. Now, who could be against a tax millage for education? For kids. The bumper stickers came out and said, fish or kids? Make your choice. What do you think happened? Fish. <laughs> kids failed. 30 to 70. 30% 30 voted for 70 against. When asked, why would you not be for kids? The answer was, we don't trust the school board. We don't trust the teachers. We don't trust the principals. If they're not going to spend the money we give them wisely, until they get their act together, we're not going to throw more money down the drain. That was the comment. 30 days later, the same voters we passed last 72 28. <coughs> same voters said 30 70 no to kids, 72 to 28 to us in favor. We asked why. They said, because you did a great job with the zoo. You spent the money wisely. We trust you. Uh, we're not against our kids. We love kids coming to the zoo, but we're not going to give away to throw it down the drain. And, and some teachers and some other people, high-ranking people, will get, some, get paid, but the teachers, went, the kids weren't being educated. We were the worst school system in the country. So we said this build an aquarium. We said three, four things we said we we're going to do. One, we said uh, it'd be built on time. It'd be built within a budget. It'd have a diversity for the first time in the design of the aquarium. Back in the 70s, 80s, it was supposed to be white architecture firms. We said, if we're going to build a public aquarium, use a public and private dollars, we wanted diversity. So we hired five architecture firms, two African American, three, three white firms. We partnered, first time that ever happened, uh, they built the aquarium, was proclaimed one of the top two or three in the world. Those African American firms now are building aquariums all over the country, all over the world. They were given an opportunity. Fourth thing we said, we would bring 870,000 people to downtown New Orleans. That's a lot of people. Those people would say hotels, but half of them <coughs> tourists. Hotels to do the shopping and spend money. Um, and that's where we failed. It didn't get 870,000 people. It got 2.3 million. Business Club every North America happened in New Orleans on the riverfront, uh, opened in 1990. Great excitement. So now we have one of the top five zoos, one of the top three aquariums. We have Audubon Park, which is, I don't know if you'll have a jog to walk, but it's a beautiful park, an Olmstead Park. We built the Waterberg Riverfront Park, the linear side, the river side of the, um, of the aquarium of the French Quarter. Uh, so we have four facilities. We go meet with Disney uh, in Orlando. And we say, Disney, we got billions of people coming to our facilities. We're showing that we can be a family destination. What can we do to encourage you to move a major Disney attraction to New Orleans? <coughs> to help bring the family market to New Orleans. And with that, they showed us around, um, and they came to a conclusion that, um, no, we're not coming to New Orleans. Could be, they were very polite, but no, that's not in our future. But we left there, and we got together, I remember sitting at the bar at the airport saying, whoa, we almost made a big mistake. What did Disney do? They took a swamp in Kissimmee, Florida, and they built a fake river. What do we have? Mississippi River, one of the greatest rivers in the world, running right through our city. We don't need a fake river. Then they put fake paddle wheel boats. What do we have? The real paddle wheel boats. Then they built fake streetcars. What do we have? Real streetcars. They built fake historic buildings. What do we have? Real historic buildings. They put jazz and music. What do we have? So we said, why are we asking Disney 
become the historical city like New Orleans, a 300-year-old city, to um, build an attraction when everything they copied is what we have with FedEx. So that's when we decide to take our facilities, the zoo, the aquarium, the park, the Lumber park, and build a collection of museums. We'll be our own Disney, like a collection of facilities, trying to all touch the river, linked by streetcar, or paddle wheel boat, you know, and all those type of things. So we added a, an IMAX theater, a 3D IMAX theater, um, does quite well. We added an insectarium. Have you heard of the insectarium? Great, great facility. How many of you all were young? Well, how many of you all like insects now? Be honest. How many don't like insects now? There's the Time to make an entrance. It's Urban Mayfield making his entrance. Um, anyway, so we go to the insectarium. Um, and you know what that does? When you were little, you remember when you had like a little doodle bug running in your hand, or a dragonfly, the mystery of life, how your eyes just glowed and gleamed, and you know, it was just a wonderful experience. That's what we want to bring back to our kids. They lost that without nature being in our city. Particularly kids that can't fly out of town and do things. So we built the insectarium. Everyone, I'm going to finish in two seconds and let you come up here and take over. Um, so we built the insectarium. So now we're up to six facilities. We built a species of Bible center, working to save endangered species. That's on the West Bank by Eagle Stern. Incredible science. How many of you all see Jurassic Park? You come to our Jurassic Park, the big gates open up. People in white lab coats in the lab. They're collecting the eggs of endangered animals. They're pulling the eggs out. They're collecting semen of endangered animals. They're making embryos outside the uterus in the lab with the lab coats. And they, they freeze it in liquid nitrogen with the idea that you have a frozen zoo to keep the species and genetics alive forever. So if ever a species nears extinction, you can throw out the, the genetics, take that embryo, and you can't put it back into the same animal, the same species, because they're endangered or threatened. You get another species that's similar. For instance, the African wild cat is just not extinct, but they're close to a domestic cat. So we take that embryo, we put it in the domestic cat, and they give birth to the African wild cat. Then you may look behind them and say, well, where did that come from? Uh, that baby doesn't look like me. <laughs> But um, it's a way to save species. So we have that at the West Bank. We have a research center out there. We have a species survival center. We have a partnership with San Diego Zoo. Their large herds of animals come together. We bring the loop animals together. So all of a sudden, we have 10 facilities. The economic value to the city is about $600 million a year. Because the people eat, stay in hotels, eating restaurants, going to urban playhouse, um, listening to music. And it's part of a healthy family attraction. So that, you know, I can go on for about another two hours, but this is a service show, not my show. Uh, but uh, I just want to give you a little background of what we do, how we do it. We do it with passion. We love what we're doing. We have about 800 employees. Um, it's a great gig, as everyone would say. Um, we have a lot of fun and a lot of fun doing it. So that's kind of tap dancing, waiting for everybody to get here. You know, why not? Round of applause, Ron Fortman. What code or no code? Or? Oh, you look good. Just like that. Go ahead and teach you your code. <laughs> so I heard you talking a little bit about the Audubon uh, experiences. Can you tell them a little bit about the other organizations that you're involved with from a volunteer standpoint? Any special one you want to talk about? I think the Superdome Commission would be really interesting. Okay, I thought you were talking about No Joe first. I want to get to that also. Okay. Um, well, first, first, um, I'm fortunate that the governor appointed me chairman of the Superdome. It's called the LSED. Um, and um, that's an incredible job. There's seven of us appointed to the board. And um, I was fortunate enough, I've been doing it for seven years since I was chairman, uh, to negotiate the new Saints contract. Um, that was extremely exciting. I, I assume no one's from the media here, is that mm. correct? In the negotiations, um, Tom Benson, who's turned out to be a really good guy, um, but he's a car salesman, and um, he had his team negotiate the contract, and it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's worth a lot of money. It had to do with real estate, it had to do with long-term contracts, it had to do with Champion Square and bringing concerts, uh, new state office building, uh, New Orleans Center got torn down and rebuilt. Um, but in the contract, we worked out to deal with our attorneys and their attorneys. Um, and we were just going to the governor's office to shake hands, say, everybody, congratulations. So we go to the governor's office. He's at the head of the table. Tom, his attorney, and his team are on one side. I'm on the side with our team. 
it was supposed to be just shaking hands, and just as we were saying congratulations, Tom, the car salesman, said, um, Bobby, I just have one thing I want. He just wanted to trade up one more time um, and after we made the deal. And he said, I need more money on the naming rights. And, you know, instead of splitting 50-50, I need 60-40. And, you know, and, and the naming rights, the Mercedes Superdome, it was worth a lot of money. But when you split it by the extra 10%, it was worth a couple million dollars a year. It's a lot of money. For 15 years, it could be worth 30, 40 million dollars. But without a th thinking for a second, the governor said, um, you know, Tom, I'm glad you shared that with me. But just one thing I want. And he gave something, and he threw on the table that was something worth about $6 million a year for 15 years worth, $90 million. So we knew, and his team knew, that Tom was getting something worth $40 million, but he was giving up something worth $90 million. $50 million in that conversation. You know, whether you want windshields or fancy you know, lights in your car, $50 million, and the governor says, Tom, I'm going to give you what you do. We have a deal. And he puts his hand in front of Tom, and his whole team was squirming. And the team knew. And all the attorneys, all they can do. Tom was looking at him. And it seemed like forever there was a pause. And the governor, without pausing for a second, said, Tom, do we have a deal? Tom shook his hand, shook his hand. We all, they walked out, and, and the governor goes, <laughs> so, same to say, $50 million just by um, negotiating a deal. The other part of that, we got to negotiate the um, Hornets contract. Uh, the Hornets, um, the owner had a problem. Um, there were three potential buyers, all of them not guaranteed to keep it in New Orleans. So in that negotiations, we had to go back, and um, the one with the deepest pockets was um, Tom Benson. We went to Tom and said, Tom, the governor called him and said, Tom, why don't you look at buying the um, Hornets? So as you know, the history is he bought the Hornets. The, now the Pelicans um, got great players. He invested a lot of money in the team, a lot of money in the coaching. They signed a 15-year contract. We rebuilt the Superdome for $400 million. We're rebuilding the arena right now for $80 million. There's Champion Square, about $50 million. Um, and what it does is guarantees sports for Louisiana for the next 15 years. And we are, other than Dallas, and we compete evenly with Dallas, we're the leaders of the country. We get more Super Bowls than anybody else, more Final Four basketball tournaments, more um, NBA All-Star games, more um, BCS championships. We get more sports, and Dallas spent a billion and a half dollars on the Dallas Stadium. With all the new stuff, our stadium is a better stadium. So that's a fun job. I, um, so it's one job I have. Um, I've chaired everything from the Chamber to Green Orleans Inc. to um, the marketing committee to conventions business bureau to, uh, but you know, as you get a little bit older, you, you get involved in a lot of things. But probably the best thing I chair right now is an organization called Nojo, New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. And are they familiar with the uh, Nojo? I don't. They should be, but I don't think they. Yeah, are. No, Nojo. Um, <laughs> what's What's unique about New Orleans is why we live here. Uh, most of us, particularly once you get your college education, you can go anywhere you want. New Orleans is different than any place else. First of all, it's almost 300 years. We'll be 300 years old in 2018. One of the oldest cities in the country. Um, it's the last European city left in the United States. It's got a French background. It's got a Spanish background. It's got a Central South America, a Haiti background. It's got diversity. Um, it's got, in that talent pool of diversity, we got great chefs. Some of the best chefs around the world love to come here. We have the greatest artists, creativity, likes to be here. Um, the architecture is unique. Uh, we're, you know, we got every season, there's, whether it's Jazz Fest or Mardi Gras or Super Bowls or this, or there's always something going on. We're a fun, quality city to live in. And one of the things in history that makes us so great is our music. It's jazz. So this guy at a young age, um, picked up a trumpet and um, plays his music and does a great job representing music. But as we were doing that, the tourist industry said, well, we don't have enough of it. Uh, 20 years ago, you said, where can I go hear jazz? Uh, you couldn't. Um, so we had to get young people to get involved, to be business-minded and getting involved. And Irvin came up with some ideas and started some incredible clubs, started some recording studios, uh, became iconic in the uh, music industry. While doing that, though, he said, I want kids to learn. We've got to keep this generational. If we do it just now, even though he's young, 
and he doesn't pass it on to the next generation, then, then it will die. So the whole idea behind it is how do you bring young people, how do you give them an opportunity to blow a horn or play a drum or, or, or get into music or write music. And um, So with that, a organization became New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. Um, Irvin, I don't know if you've run um, Welcome Yet. I am. Just a great business guy, piano player. Um, and um, they do good music, but they do good business now. And with that, we said that we needed a permanent home for jazz in New Orleans. And so with that, um, and this is not a real large organization at the time, uh, but needed to raise over $10 million to build a um, center for jazz. Uh, and now the money was raised. Um, it's under construction. It's supposed to open in March. Um, right on, is it Martha, Martin Luther King? Martha Luther King and Aretha Castle. Right Hill. on the corner, right by the Reconcile Restaurant at that whole area of town. Beautiful new center. It's a place that by daytime kids will learn music. Uh, there'll be classes, uh, there'll be lectures, but by nighttime there'll be music playing um, led by Urban. So I, I chair that, that group, having a lot of fun with it. You know, the key with a lot of stuff we do. If you have fun, then you're going to be successful. If you're not having fun, go do something else. You know, life's too short not to have fun. So those are some of the things I work on, and um, I'm blessed that I've been around doing these things, and um, I'm excited about next March with the um, with the opening, the Jazz Market. Talk about leadership. How long have you been with the Audubon Institute? Forty years. I started when I was eleven. <laughs> Talk about 40 years in one job yep. and uh, talk about leadership. First of all, you know, if you had asked me when I was 24 years old um, what I'd be doing the rest of my life, I would have never come up to work running, running a zoo. Um, I was um, in the military to the Vietnam War. Fortunately, I didn't have to go to war, but I was in the war, drafted in the Army then. Um, I got out, I was in graduate school, and um, Mayor Landrew, Moon Landrew, <laughs> Mitch's dad, uh, was the mayor, very dynamic like Mitch, came to the um, MBA school and much like this, gave a lecture, and he talked about uh, working for the city much like the Peace Corps. Give a couple years to the city to help make it better, and what you would get out of it was, first of all, you'd see your city grow and be enriched, but you'd meet a lot of people who have a great experience um, and so, um, being a hippie back then, and long hair, and skinny, and you know, loving peace and love, and you know, trying to make the world a better place, I took the job. I got assigned to the zoo. And the question was, do we tear it down because it was so bad, or do we fix it up? But well, that was an easy answer for a 24-year-old. Um, uh, besides, pretty women running around baby strollers, and um, <laughs> um, um, and all the good things that went with it, families and kids went back to the mayor and he got behind rebuilding the zoo. Um, so I've been doing it 40 years. And, and, and I shared with the class earlier that, that um, I get paid nicely for a job. I get a nice pay, but if people really knew how much I love the job, they would ask me to pay them. Um, so it's a, it's a great opportunity. And um, with that, you, you're placed in a place, it's almost like um, riding a bike. You know, when you're little, you get on a bike, it terrifies you. I'm not, you know, I'm going to fall, blah, blah, But once you get on a bike and start riding, it's like, this is fun. Well, now I want to get on the handlebars of the bike. I want to, you know, leadership is about confidence, about having a vision. I was fortunate. I got involved with the zoo. It turned into a success. So with the success, I said, well, what else are we going to do? And so we said, let's build an aquarium. Let's do this. Let's do that. So um, I've been fortunate to, to, to be in a position. Um, I just got off the phone driving here with a person running for governor, Scott Angel, from Lafayette. He has a good chance of winning. But now, if you don't call me and hug an animal, don't expect to be governor, don't expect to be a U.S. senator, don't expect to be mayor, uh, because we've got hundreds of thousands of people to support us. And that leadership came over the years, step by step. And I think it's, you know, one success leads to the other. Who would you say was your greatest influence in terms of being a uh, mentor? That's a good question. I would probably start off with Moon Landrum. Uh, Moon, Moon was a dynamic mayor. He was that close to being president. He, as mayor of New Orleans, he um, did great things, particularly um, in bringing the community together, black and white. It was, it was a very fragile time, and he was a leader. And um, he took the heat he had to take to do it on both sides of the fence, and it brought people together. Uh, when he did that, 
he was asked by, she went to his friends with that. He was asked to be, um, I guess it must have been Carter. Mm -hmm. He was asked to be um, Secretary of HUD. Uh, so he took over HUD, uh, and that's when New York was going through a bankruptcy. He handled the bankruptcy for New York, and New York's so powerful with so many people, and he did such a good job, his name began surfacing against the Democratic nominee for um, president. Usually, you, at that point, you're in a group like maybe 10 names. So, I mean, you, in this whole country to be in top 10 names being talked about, obviously he didn't, he didn't get the nomination and didn't win, but um, he was an incredible leader. And Mitch is the same way. I predict that, that if you wanted to bet a dollar and win a hundred dollars, that um, Mitch may be president one day. Mitch is a um, same dynamic, um, don't always agree with him. He's got a head like this wall, but, um, but he's good. He's very, very talented. And if you look at what brings presidents to success, besides is their past success, is their ability to communicate. And that if you look at, um, I guess going back to, to Reagan, uh, he was just a great communicator. You go back to Clinton, he was a great communicator, Obama. Um, our own governor, Bobby Jindal, who I love dearly, don't always agree with his politics also, uh, but you remember, he, he probably uh, too young, but um, he gave a speech when, when um, the president got elected, spoke to the House for the first time. It was a cheerleading out, you know, everybody cheered, standing ovations. It was his first speech to Congress. And uh, Bobby was asked to do the rebuttal speech for the Republican Party, and he did a terrible job. So now he wants to be president. You gotta be able to get in front of the camera. You gotta be able to... So I think I think Moon is probably um, one of those people. Um, I would give another name you probably won't know is a guy named uh, Marlon Perkins. And Marlon Perkins was a TV celebrity. Um, he talked about from Mutual Omaha did um, animal shows, and um, while he would lecture about the animal, he would have Jim, his cohort, wrestle with the crocodile, and he was rolling all over, and the crocodile was hitting him with the tail. And, and Mullins just, and the crocodile weighs, you know. Um, but the guy, I love it, he was the director or CEO of the St. Louis Zoo. But he became very, very famous because of the wildlife show. Um, but he loved what he was doing. That was saving wildlife. So a combination of the moon, you know, about the city, the passion you could bring to the table, the leadership you could bring to the table, Mullins Perkins, who became a celebrity but never forgot who he was, were two great role models. What would you say was your biggest... I mean, 40 years is a long time to be in one position. Not at all. <laughs> it's all relative. What would you say it was your biggest challenge uh, that you had to overcome in your job? I think, I think as a young man, the biggest challenge was change. The city of New Orleans, um, which I just described as one of the best cities in the world, uh, used to be bigger in my young age, was bigger than Atlanta, population bigger than Dallas, bigger than Houston, bigger than Dallas. We were one of the biggest cities um, in the South, and all the other cities were passing us up, particularly with job creation. So some of us, like Audubon, said, let's go for world class, let's do this, do that. A lot of people said, leave it alone. Change is not something we feel good about. You know, if we had the microphone and the water here and you moved it like this, those people go right back and I don't, I don't feel good about that. Mm -hmm. So we had to fight change and so everything we did, everything we did, we had to go to the U.S. Supreme Court at the end of the day, they didn't want to expand the zoo. A lot of that had to do with black white, by the way. You know, there the was part of the history that, um, that we wanted to expand the zoo, bring more people, and the neighbors said, well, I don't know, we want more people. They didn't say black, but, but you could read into, into the message back in the 70s what they were saying. Um, so change is probably the hardest thing we had to do, um, and even as recently as in every project, all ten we've done, everyone went, went through a battle. Um, I had my window broken in my car, I had hate letters. We started a project, I had people who I knew well, as I go jogging around the park, looked the other way. They were my best, not my best friend, they were good friends, but they could never be my best friend with that attitude. <laughs> they were friends before, and now they would look the other way because they were mad what we were doing at the golf course. Uh, the golf course got finished, and everybody became my best friend again. But change is hard. Change is difficult for people. And, um, and we fell behind a lot of cities. And if you looked at it, that population started going down. You looked at the poverty levels started going down. Our schools kept going down. 
Um, so we need, we need to protect the past, but also build the future. And that's not an easy thing for people to accept. What would you say uh, was one of the most difficult personal challenges that you had to go through in leadership, a skill set, or something you had to develop personally? Hmm. Yeah, the one thing I learned, and I was fortunate to be young, and I loved sports when I was young, was um, the value of a team. That, that no matter what sport you play, um, there's always some better than others. But that MVP, Drew Brees can't win a Super Bowl without Graham and Colston and Cook and all the other players. You gotta be part of a team. And, and that, that, because I was so young and I do so little, running a bad facility turned into a really good facility, that um, I valued people that knew a lot more than I knew and put people together in a room with me. And 40 years later, um, that skill set has probably brought the biggest success is that there's a lot of people that work for me that are a lot smarter than me, know much more about reptiles or, or, or raising money. No, not raising money, I know more than them about raising money. <laughs> uh, but they know a lot more about me about a lot of things. And by all coming together, and as much as you could put the other one up front, if it's someone else's idea, if it's someone else can get the success and the credit, the more success you're going to have. And that was one of the things. So going from a small operation, knowing how am I going to get this done, to knowing the value of the team, now, now I have a great team and a great board of directors and, and great, great leadership. Um, I don't, I, I've been blessed that um, if we had any failures, you learn very quickly to forget it. But hanging on to a failure, there's no good. We, we all have failures, we all trip. But if you hang on it, then you're stuck on that subject, and you're stuck on failure, and you're not going to the next project. So, so the faster you can pick yourself up. <coughs> so, for instance, we lost the tax mill election. Recently. Yeah. Recently. That was a failure. So what we do the next morning, we got our staff together, and we said we're going to get back to our core values, what we do each day. We're going to make sure people love us as much as they always did, and we'll go to the voters again. So that, that became yesterday's news on Monday morning. And then we stopped dwelling. You know, you, you know, we could dwell on that forever. Mm -hmm. Oh, gee, the voters said no. Well, the voters said no for a lot of good reasons. Um, so. If you were a student today um, sitting in this classroom and the president and CEO of this large organization that does really good work uh, and the chairman of, you know, one of the most powerful organizations in the city, sitting in this room, and we're talking about a host of things that may seem very distant from where you are, because right. you're just working on right. getting your your degree. Um, where do you get started, and what are the what are the questions you ask Ron Foreman if you were a student sitting in class? Yeah, I think I think first I would ask Ron Foreman, do you have any jobs available? <laughs> That would be a good question to ask. <laughs> if I was in a room, I'd say, uh, you got any jobs? Um, I think some of the other things I'd, I'd like to share, if, 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 if I was a student in the room and I'd want to hear, is um, what brings success? And without a question, you got to do something you enjoy. If Irvin was not having fun playing a trumpet, he wouldn't be a terrible trumpet player. You find what it is that turns you on, that motivates you. Because a job should be fun. It should be something you can't wait to do each day. Not, oh, gee, I got to get up early, and I got to do this, I got to do that. Now, you're going to have to do tasks along the way. I swept exhibits, I, I shoveled elephant poop, you know, I did all the stuff that, that um, but, but the big picture was there. So, you know, find, find, find the, the career you want to do. And if you got to struggle with it a little bit, struggle with it. Uh, um, and, and, and go for it. Then I guess the second thing that would bring success is whatever you do, do it with passion. If you like it, if you love it, then be pa bring passion to the job. It's not, gee, my paycheck is this. It's, it's um, I'm changing the world. I'm making a difference. And you can make a difference whether you're a nurse taking care of a sick person or whether you're a groundskeeper that landscapes the grounds in a beautiful way or, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So doing it with passion um, is, is critical to whatever you do. And um, I guess lastly, um, 
don't be shy about that passion. You know, share your feelings, share your thoughts. You know, I bet you everyone in this room has a, something unique about you that's different from the other person. And if you can share that uniqueness of the beauty you have in a passionate way, in doing what you enjoy doing, you're just gonna keep going to the top, making a difference. And uh, it's not that, that you know, tough to learn. You know, it's, I, I, my kids now, my, my youngest is still in college, but um, you know, the whole time they grew up, and my daughter now works for a conservation organization in New York. Um, she doesn't get paid much money, um, she's just starting, but um, she loves her job. Um, and you know, so that, that, that makes a big difference. Um, did I answer your question? I think so. What is your favorite word? Favorite word is um, nature. What is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? I, let me go to the, the all three are different answers. So. Okay. But the spiritual side, um, I love reading um, interpretations of whether whatever religion it is. I'm, I'm a um, personally a big supporter of religions that teach you know love and value and family and all that are all great. But I love reading the readings of people interpreting and and it's amazing if you just take a little time because I don't want to preach religion. But on just hearing some of those messages, you know, one of the messages I was just reading, you know, it was tied to the millage. Lose the millage. I'm going through some readings, and, and there was a message that whatever God you wanted to think it was from, saying um, worrying is a wasted energy. You know, if you worry about something, you're taking time you can't do anything about. Um, and you're wasting time, and you're not going to change anything. Worrying has never changed anything. And, it, and they quoted some quotes from the Bible, and, you know, about, and it was just simple things, simple things of life that, that civilizations have lived with for a long time that I love. There's little messages out there all the time. So I think on the religious side, um, I think spiritually also, my favorite thing, if I want to be close to God, is to hug a two, three, four hundred year old oak tree. Have you all ever hugged a tree? Cool stuff. If you haven't hugged a tree, the next time you see a beautiful tree, just get as close as you can, put your arms around it, put your face on it, look up and you see all these tree branches. That tree's been there 400 years. It's, 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 we're in 2014, 1614. What do you think that tree's seen in the 400 years? So it's, you know, and it's still alive and flourishing. And I mean, so you know, you want to get you want to get spiritual and 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 look at nature and and embrace it and love it and um. And you, you feel it. You can feel the power. Man, that tree is strong. I want to be like that tree. I want to be strong like that tree. And um, so, um, yeah, nature and, and, and the love of um, nature and uh, the beauty of life and are all things that, that, are, that kind of touch my heart. What turns you off? You know, interesting. What turns me off, I don't know if it's the worst thing that turns me off, I don't like big cocktail parties. I like parties. I like dinner with <laughs> ten people, but not love listening to music. Okay. Music's different. But if I got if I got to hear someone say, "Hey, man, how you doing?" You know, for the fiftieth time, and I can't hear them, and they can't hear me when I tell them how I'm doing. You know, it, it, it's not my deal. Now, do I love plays? New York, just in New York, so a great play. Do I love music? I love performance. Great concert tonight at the Superdome. Um, I love I love those kind of things, but I. That pretending like you're in a conversation in a loud room, you know, and not hearing a word anyone's saying, and they, it, it, and it's not just because I'm getting older, because I remember, you know, going to concerts. Not kind of bad word, going to events when I was younger. And I couldn't hear that either, um, and my ears are fine. So I, I don't like, I don't like, um, I don't like meaningless conversation. It's a waste of time. What is your favorite curse word? I don't know any. <laughs> Favorite curse word. Favorite or least favorite? Or both. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> oh, come on, Ryan. I guess, I guess if, if it comes out, it's got to be the F word. <laughs> it just flows naturally. Um, 
That would be I don't have favorites. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you go on that one. Okay, let me go that one. What is your favorite curse you. word? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what sound or noise do you love? I love a trumpet noise. There's nothing sweeter than a trumpet player getting the music out. Is that a good answer? Uh, okay. I, actually, I do. I love, I, love, I love jazz. I love the sound of jazz. I love, I love as it all comes together. I love the harmony of it. I love the um, sound of it. And then you put a voice behind it, um, it just makes you want to move. Um, what sound or noise do you hate? Sound or noise that I hate. I hate when I try to fall asleep and I hear um, the alarm mm -hmm. battery ticking and keeping me awake. I don't know, it, uh, there's not many sounds I don't like, but you know, when I relax and, and want to chill out, I don't want to hear noise. Okay. I think there's too much noise in the world. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, you don't know this, but um, I don't want to keep kissing up to you, but um, I did play trumpet when I was in up high school. Um, Are you serious? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. <laughs> it was called cornet then. <laughs> I had a little cornet, and I was a cornet player, and um, I was not very good. Um, but I remember I, I would pick up some of those jazz tunes, and um, they'd give you the little notes you could play, and ba 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 you know, and I would play. Um, um, I guess what other profession? I, if, you know what I'd really like to be? What? I'd give you three jobs. One, one I'd like to be... Secretary of the Interior for the U.S. government. Everything about nature in the country, the minerals of our country, and protecting wildlife for our country. Good, good job. The second job I like to be was when Eisner was the um, CEO of Disney. Being the CEO of Disney would be a job I would really like. And I, I, I was involved in designing one of the team that helped design uh, the Animal Kingdom at Disney. So there was an opportunity to be part of that team, um, but I wanted to be the president of the team. Um, uh, and I didn't quite get that offer either. <laughs> Those two offers didn't, didn't happen. And, um, I guess the third, I'd like to be, um, I'd like to be a little bit better than um, Drew Brees, his quarterback for New Orleans Saints. <laughs> and I think Drew Brees is the best. I want to be the very best quarterback. Sure, why not? You okay. ask me those are the things I want. <laughs> no one's offering me anything. <laughs> what profession would you like not to do? What profession would I like not to do? I would like not to be an um, astronaut. The, the <laughs> <laughs> Sending me to the moon one way makes me a little nervous. And I'm, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to be an astronaut. Okay. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well, heaven does exist. It exists in our life every single day. In my life every day, I feel heaven. It's a taste of it. Again, it goes back when I see the birds flying, when I see a kid come and hug me because a giraffe just got born, uh, you know, and I see a fish you know, doing something, when I see a flower bloom. You know, nature, heaven is beautiful. It's all around us right now, and I can't imagine how much better it's going to even be at the next level of heaven, um, and I hope I'm asked to, um, to help keeping nature from di not disappearing. More animals will become extinct in our lifetime than the history of man combined before us. Meaning, you know, the, the African elephant, 30% of the population has died in the last three years through poaching. You know, we're, we're too smart for that. You know, the, in Africa, you know, what a wonderful thing to have beautiful wildlife. And it's, we're supposed to be smart. We're supposed to have the brain power. Yet, um, particularly the Chinese love the, for ornaments, for trophies, for, and um, they're scooping the tusk off the elephant, and I'm killing them. So if I'm in heaven, I want the job of um, protecting God's creatures. Hmm. Let's open up questions for Ron Foreman. Yep. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I was wondering who was going to be first. Give me your name and number. What, what, first of all, what, um, tell me about your background a little bit, real quickly. My like background, like job, or like what's my major? Major and back, and any interest you have. I am a 
am business administration and minoring in marketing. Good. And I'm looking into getting a job right now in an animal shelter, but I feel like this Good. is a new level. All right. <laughs> my, my email address is rforman, no E, F O R M A N, at audubon, A U D U B O N, Audubon Institute. Dot org. Send me, send me some information. We have openings to marketing. Not on that right now, but you know, this things appear at different times, and you got to kiss a lot of frogs along the way, and um, <laughs> you get there, and the jobs you know, become good develop. Yeah. Can you say email again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only telling her. She has first. <laughs> or foreman. Did you get it? No. Or foreman, F O R M A N at Audubon, A-U-D-U-B-O-N, institute.org. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I know you were talking about what y'all have right now uh, as uh, attractions uh, for Audubon Institutes. Are there <coughs> future um, attractions That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, the answer, yes. Uh, the, 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 the question is when. Uh, if you had asked that question in 2004 before the hurricane, we were blowing and going at such a high level. Our background, and you learn this in marketing, that, that um, in a population of a million two, a million three, which we have regionally in, in New Orleans, metropolitan population, that's really an average size city, and you can't have a bunch of world-class attractions with that level of population. Won't get enough attendance, won't raise enough money. So we learned a long time ago to rely on tourists. And in 2004, we had 10 million tourists in town. So 10 million tourists, 1.3, now we have an audience of 11.3 million. That was enough to, to make things happen. The hurricane came, we lost all our tourists. Um, so, and two tourists came back, and they're just about back now, about 9 million now. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're starting to look for new opportunities. Um, I was a big proponent and helped lead the effort to try to tear down the World Trade Center. Um, and right on the foot of Canal Street, to build, um, Chicago has the Tricentennial Park. It's right on their waterfront, lakefront of Chicago. It's a beautiful park with the beautiful monuments and a concert hall. And uh, that would that would have been a great attraction. It looks like we'll get half of it. It looks like the building will be renovated into a hotel, which the city will generate money from. Not a bad idea, but we wanted to, we wanted. There's a lot of hotels could be built anywhere. That was right on Canal Street, the riverfront. Uh, so that's probably one of the things. Um, yeah, one day if if we really have the luxury, I'd love to do a future man exhibit, museum. Uh, what's the future of man? You know, we know what's happened in the past. We know what's happening today. We can think what's happening maybe in 2015, but what's going to happen in 2025 or 2050? What's going to happen when you guys have grandkids? And how that affects the world and how it affects nature, and through the through the innovation of um, technology now, you can present things so realistic and in such a wonderful way. That I think that'd be really an interesting thing, showing the past through kind of natural history museums, the present through zoos, insectariums, nature centers, IMAX theaters, survival centers, in the future from a future man museum. Other questions. for like the extinction of tigers? Extinction of tigers, uh, every species is put into a program called, uh, you're not gonna believe what I'm gonna really say, it's put into a program called ISIS. Uh. <laughs> inventory Species, International Species Inventory System. When you change that name. Exactly. <laughs> the other guy's got to get wiped out, so they keep our name. Exactly. Uh, so, and so every animal is on a computer now, and we know exactly, as best counts we have, what's in the wild, what's in captivity, and we know the genetics of each animal in captivity. So we don't crossbreed animals. And it used to be animals used to be owned by each city or each zoo or each aquarium. <coughs> now animals are blown to the next generation. So we send animals back and forth in breeding situations. And that's why I talked about the species of Avalon, the frozen zoo is trying to save species. If, and if they start becoming extinct, we have a frozen zoo. Uh, we're working against San Diego um, on the West Bank. They're, they're putting large herds of animals together to try to protect them. So the tiger is one of the animals um, in Asia and India that, um, that's um, in trouble. Um, and their reason for trouble is not for trophy collecting, it's more for habitat destruction. 
Um, and that's a tough battle. As, as people grow, populations grow, habitats disappear. As habitats disappear, the natural boundaries for an animal goes away and um, they disappear. Other thoughts? Questions? Yeah. Uh, the Species Survival Center, like, is that something that just a general population can, can no. visit? Or? That's the one strictly to scientists. Uh -huh. We bring some, we, we, have, we have two chairs endowed from UNO to work out there. Uh, there's some classes that come out. Okay. Uh, we work with Tulane, Xavier, LSU, UNO, uh, but the general public okay. does not come out there. We have a beautiful lodge out there with the water where the animals come to. We use for fundraising and fun dinners. And um, it may one day to my future projects with our partnership with San Diego, five years from now, 10 years from now, we might turn that into an animal park we can actually learn how we're saving species and let the public come out there. But right now, I don't know the answers now. Okay. Other questions? I know you got a class of four. I'm sorry? Your class ends at four. Oh, what time is class in? Yeah. Oh, we're good. We're good on time. But we're, hey, well, I was the class. We're wrapping up. Yeah, I was the class. I always knew when it was time to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I heard you talking a lot about uh, politics and um, local and national. Uh, how involved would you say that you are in that, if at all, right now? Because you know, you seem to know a lot that's about it. Question. Like on the inside, yeah. You, have, yeah, you, you ask, see that's the inside connections there. Let me, let me share the family story. <laughs> um, Ray Nagin was a very close friend of mine. Uh, he was my mayor. Uh, happened to get elected. My wife went to work for him in communications. You know, when he first got elected, he he was a good guy when he first got elected. And I believed in him, he was a good mayor. I was with him during the hurricane at the Hyatt Hotel. I go make my rounds. I had three different pickup trucks stolen from me. Because whenever I left my truck to go walk in the water to get to Hyatt, I come back the next day and someone hot wired and was gone just to get out of town. Um, so he was my mayor. But after the hurricane, I think Ray Nagin went brain dead. I think um, the crisis, seeing people dead on the street, people trying to hold them, have babies to take care of. Um, some people, you know, he wasn't, a, he wasn't hired to do that job. He was hired to run a city, not to take on the worst crisis in the country. Um, and so um, with that, he wasn't doing his job. And, and I got mad at him. And after numerous conversations, um, I finally said, Mr. Mayor, you're no longer my mayor. You're not, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then um, I've been asked to run for mayor. I'm going to run for mayor against you. So I ran for mayor. Uh, there was 23 of us. Um, at the time I ran, all the research said I'd be in a runoff with Ray Nagin. Um, and that's, that was the strategy. Raised $3 million in three days. People showed up with $5,000 checks, which is the max we can give, um, and big, big wads of checks. Um, so I was off and running. Um, politics is a strange benefit of that because I was encouraged to run by Mary Lander and Mitch Lander. We need, we need somebody to run against Ray. Um, so about three days before registration, Mitch called me and said, well, come meet with him. I said, sure. He said, um, Ron, um, I thought about it. I'm running for mayor. And, um, and, and now I've known Mitch. Now I started out of the moon. So I've known Mitch for a long, long time. I've known Mary. But jet ski with Mary. I've traveled with him. Yeah, I know him well. Um, so I was kind of taken back. Um, I was taken back for two reasons. One was that um, don't ask me to run. I got my neck stuck way out. I raised money from people. I spent money. And now you say you want, you want to run. You want me to step out. Um, and secondly, um, was that um, people put up their money. And they gave me their money to run. And I spent probably half a million of their money. Uh, and just to back out, um, was not going to be an easy thing to do, and um, and I guess, and I guess um, lastly, um, the flag was on the ground. You got you got to just think about it for a second, and I'm sure you know some are here today. But those who were in town right after, right during the hurricane, um, it was an abandoned city. Um, it was no street lights, no water, no sewage. Um, People on rooftops, devastation, dying people, they are not doing his job. Uh, so I really felt the flag was on the ground. 
and that the city has been really good to me for the last 30 plus years, and I, and I love the city. So I, I grabbed the flag. I was running with the flag, and you know when you finally decide you can do it, and everybody gets behind you, and all of a sudden someone says, "Hand me the flag now." Uh, uh, that was a tough thing. But the last thing, which is factual also, I couldn't beat Mitch. All the numbers said of the 23 candidates. If Mitch is in a race, it'd be Ray Nagin and Mitch in a runoff. I'd be a third. So with that, knowing I, that it'd be very difficult to beat him, and in politics, the only way you can win and stuff like that is you got to go on the attack. And he's my friend. Like I said, I've known him since a young man. Um, and they wanted me to go attack on TV commercials saying, um, Mitch is soft on crime. And I said, well, show me how he's soft on crime. And they showed me a bill he passed as state legislator, which was for like, 15, 16 year old boys, young men, that did not a crime, but, but um, had a choice to either go into some care you know, facility or could stay home but had to be in a program while they did it. They gave them the to, to chance to, to get their act together. I kind of liked the legislation. It was good legislation. And that's how he was supposed to be not tough on crime, but by, help, by letting these kids not go to jail. Um, so, how do you run against that? Anyway, I ran. But, but, but having done, never run before, politics is a, you gotta go for the juggler. If you don't go for the juggler, you can't knock the guy off the front of you. You can't knock the guy in front of you, you can't win. So I ran a race that was pretty, was, was not a race. We talked about doing things that, um, that I really liked the race. I like being with people, but it's hard to run a race when you, when you, you know you can't win. And so that, I, I ran a race, came in third. Um, and had no interest in running again, and didn't have an interest before the hurricane in running. But but it's back to that passion, back to that drive. And then I, I love the city. This has been very, very good to my family, to myself. Um, I've lived here my whole life. Um, and then, um, then I, I knew I could make a difference. Now, having said that, I think Mitch, who lost to Ray, remember that, he lost to Ray. Ray goes into the underground and does a lot of bad things. Um, Mitch Woods next time, Mitch did a great job. So that's what really counts. So I, 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 I've, I've been close to every governor, not every governor, every governor since um, Evan Edwards. Um, that's about as early as far back as I went. Edward Edwards and the whole group I've been close to. I've been, if I have to with every governor, every mayor, I might not like their politics. It might not even like the person. But once they get elected, I, re I really respect the position. If you're president, you're my president. If you're governor, you're my governor. If you're mayor, you're my mayor. And what can I do to help? So I work whoever that person is to make them as successful as they can. And with that, audubon has gotten a lot of money, a lot of support, but I've made a lot of good friends. And you know, I've been fortunate to meet with presidents in the White House. I've been you know, every governor, every mayor. Um, we've been friends. And like I said, if you want to get elected to an office in Louisiana or New Orleans, you better come see me and hug an animal. Get your picture taken. Because if you don't, you're not going to win the election. Did that answer? Yeah. Other thoughts, questions? <coughs> All right, when are you all coming to the zoo? I have another go, go for it. Money. Go for it. Um, I feel like you know a lot about where the city's headed mm -hmm. um, based on your experiences of the past. If you were in school now, where would you choose to major? Where do you see jobs coming? Yeah. The future. I, think that's I regret not asking that to everybody who's yeah. been here because everybody he's brought in, they're so, they know everything about the city. Yeah. Some of them said like oil and, you yeah. know, getting chemistry jobs. I mean, uh, majors is good, but I want your take on it. Yeah, let me first to tell you a little bit about my opinion about New Orleans. New Orleans, a 300 year old city, I tell you the first 100, 150 years, one of the biggest cities in the country. After that, another 50 years, 75 years, the biggest city in the South. Last 75 years, decline, 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 decline. We're going up again. First time, in my opinion, watching the economic growth, opportunities for young people, um, job creation, economic development, uh, housing, values going way up. Um, the city's on a road. New hospitals are being built. UMC, the, the um, the um, VA hospital could create tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, so 
So if you like anything in medical, medical strong. Anything supporting not just doctors, but anything in the, in the medical technology field, type of medicine, strong, strong, strong. Um, if you're in the arts field, we have more theaters now than ever been renovated. Um, most doing well. Um, so if you're in the arts, um, everything from marketing the arts to being a performer to owning the theater to to um, you know sales whatever is doing well. Tourism and and tourism sometimes gets a bad rap. I chaired the, the convention of business bureau. It gets a bad rap. Um, Man, those are just housekeeper jobs. Of the of the eighty thousand jobs in tourism, yeah, there's probably a couple thousand in housekeeping. Um, but not that you should get your degree and work to be a waiter. But waiters make a hundred thousand a year, eighty thousand a year. If you're good and sharp, and you, you know, there's big opportunities. Then back to marketing and advertising and promotion and business and sales and. You know, the hotel industry is a is a major major growing. Uh, the Port of New Orleans um, dealing with um, merchandise coming in and out. If you have the ability to figure out how to manufacture anything, the ability to um, to get ship it to and from places is right here. Um, to take a product and improve it, and then sell, send it out. Bring it in as a raw product, turn it into something else, send it out. Um, um, through the port is a um, is is a um, is a big opportunity. Uh, the idea of village. I don't know if you follow that at all, but the idea of village is about um, starting new businesses, and particularly with technology and social media, the ability to, to develop a product. And an idea of village teaches how to put the business plan together, how to get financing for your product, and and. Pretty much social media. How do you use social media to get the project moving, and then then works with you? That um, the idea of village and technology um, is a is a is a big 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 opportunity. So um, and another thing is government. Uh, you know, I don't want to rule out government. Government, you know, for those that have a love for city planning, for urban planning, for um, for politics, for um, for um, running a streets department, engineering, or traffic. You know, you know, but I think the biggest message I'd said to someone young is that um, New Orleans is a city of opportunity. Um, and network, you know, communicate your, your skills. Um, like I said, you got to kiss a lot of frogs along the way and uh, be a lot of people. There's a plenty of opportunity. And I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, and our community, all new schools will be, public schools are being built. Um, I think it's a great city. I think the city is doing well. Um, and what I love why I'm here is because the city has soul as well as opportunity. Uh, before we had soul with no opportunity, uh, opportunities back again. And it's younger people. We have more young people moving to New Orleans. New Orleans is the place to move to. The, the cities that I think do the best right now is Washington, D.C., New Orleans, um, as I hear, uh, where they have old cities and they're taking the inner cities and redeveloping them uh, for opportunities. Uh, because you can walk to work, uh, you can ride your bike to work, you can take public transportation. It used to be suburbs, suburbs, the Republicans all said, your dream house is a big lawn with a white fence living in the suburbs. Those people in the suburbs got tired of driving two hours to their white fence each morning and each <laughs> afternoon. Everybody wants to get in the inner city. The downtown, the warehouse district is hot. The Marion Bywater neighborhood is hot. So for young people, this is a great city. Uh, and, and it won't be, you know, right now it's probably more difficult than I've ever known for someone to get a job right away. But if you look and work hard enough, you'll get that job. <clears throat> and this is a place, it's a great place to have a job and a great place to live. Let's thank our guest, Ron Foreman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Enjoy. So when y'all come in, who needs passes? Serious. Give me.